Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Light on the Rock. Boy, today's an exciting day. It's today's message is about the Feast of Blasts, Trumpets. It'll be done by the time most of you see this on the website. Uh, some of you are keeping it on Monday. Uh, some of you are keeping it on Tuesday or Wednesday. But whenever it comes around to you, I hope you'll get a chance to hear this. It is such an exciting day. Uh, This day pictures the countdown to the return of our awesome God, Son of God, with his angelic army, scores of thousands of his saints, and his bride with him as we all land on the Mount of Olives. It's coming closer and closer. It'll happen soon now. And there's a lot to the story that we have to fill in. And so that's what we'll do. I hope you listen carefully and excitedly and prayerfully. Let's just, in fact, ask our great Father in heaven to... Be with us. Father in heaven, we just come to you as we talk about the glorious return of your son, how you're going to involve so many people in that and so many angels, and you'll be right in the middle of it. And Yeshua, our Savior, is going to come as King of Kings, as Yehovah here on earth. And uh, you are Yehovah in heaven, Almighty God. We just absolutely adore you, love you, and ask your blessing on this. Be with all those who are hearing this sermon. Open their eyes to see your truth, open their ears to hear it. And even talk to them in, 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 in what you want them to hear from this. And guide me and may your anointing be on this very, very important topic. The Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, 2018. Well, Father in heaven, thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much in our mighty Yeshua. Well, it's such an exciting day. Traditional uh, Church of God teaching for the past 60 years or more has been that the Feast of Trumpets encompasses everything all in one day. It's about the time Christ returns. We're changed to spirit. Uh, those who are his people at, at his return and those who have died will be resurrected. We return to land on the Mount of Olives all in one day, probably on the Feast of Trumpets, even though Yeshua says, of that day and hour, no one knows, Matthew 24. But I submit that this would mean we're hovering over Jerusalem for months and months. If you see the time sequence, as I'll explain today, as there are seven final last plagues to unfold, there's a better and more biblical explanation. I hope you'll listen carefully. The Jews call this day Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, the first of the year, the beginning. But the true beginning of the year is in the spring. That's what God said in Exodus 12, verses 1 and 2. He said, this shall be the beginning of months for you. And that was the month of Aviv, also called Nisan, which means new beginning. And so this is the date that God himself ordained, Nisan one, Aviv one, not in the spring, not, not the autumn first day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, the, the name, it's not even the name that God gives this day in the Bible. The, the name he gives is Yom Teruah. Yom means day, and Teruah means bless or shouts can mean trumpet blast, but it also can mean shouts, a lot of noise. This sermon is about the first of the four final holy days. We're on, we're on day one of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar, which usually falls in mid-September to mid-October of our calendar. And all last four holy days fall, land on this day, on this month. And so um, these are very special holy days, special times ordained by our Creator. Turn with me, if you will, to Leviticus 23. That's the chapter that tells us and lists all seven holy days. And these holy days are actually, I want you to really get this point, they're actually pivotal dates on which the greatest events of world and universal history have ever occurred and ever will occur. The ones in the spring are mostly ones that have already occurred. I believe Pentecost is a transition date, uh, including some things that have already occurred and things yet to come. And then the autumn ones are of dates, very important dates of things yet to come. So let's start by reading Leviticus 23 in verse 23 to 25. This is all it says about it um, in the Bible, um, at least in Leviticus 23, about the about the uh, days of uh, days of uh, of uh, trumpets, the feast of trumpets, and then Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Leviticus twenty three twenty three, verse twenty four. Now speak to the children of Israel, 
saying in the seventh month, that's a Hebrew month, not July, okay, on the first day of the month, that's what we call the new moon, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial, a blowing. Uh, actually, the Hebrew words uh, don't include the words trumpets. It just means a teruah, a noise, a blast, shout, a holy convocation, a getting together. And you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire. So it's a day you should not have gone to work. It's a day you're not out there shopping and buying and doing business. Um, it's a holy day, not holiday. It's a holy day of God. Less is said about this holy day in Leviticus 23 than all the other holy days. Possibly the eighth day has about as much said. Not a lot said about that also. Uh, this is, holy day is also mentioned in Numbers. And um, briefly there, this is a day of jubilation or shouts and trumpets. Um, the original Hebrew word again is teruah, blast. The original does not have the specific meaning of of trumpets. Young's literal translation of that part of the verse Leviticus 23:24 is that on the first day of this month you have a Sabbath, a memorial of shouting, a holy convocation is the way the Young's literal translation puts it. So it can mean shouts of joy, teruah, T E R U A H. Again, it's probably best that you print out the notes and have them there with you as you listen. Uh, you'll get more out of each one if if you listen and have notes, because I'll have some extra things in both. Teruah can mean shouts of joy, shouts of fear. It can mean blast. It could be a scream. It could be a shout. It could be a, a group cheer. It, it could be a blast of an impending battle. It could be sirens. It could be blasts of joyous triumph. You'll see this as you if you look up the word teruah and look up all the ways it's used. For God's people, it's going to be shouts of extreme joy. It's going to be blasts of shouts of jubilation like a loud group cheer you can hear from miles away. And for those about to be killed and punished by the king of kings, it's going to be shouts of despair, screams, shouts of defiance. This day is associated with the day of the Lord, actually a one-year period leading up to Christ's return. But in any case, the major events of the plan of salvation have so far happened on exactly the holy days that pictured them, so I don't see any reason why that wouldn't continue. For example, Passover. Up to the very minute when the Passover lamb was killed, this was exactly to the minute 3 p.m. when the Son of God, the Lamb of God, was killed. That's at 3 p.m. was when the Jews were sacrificing the Lamb for the nation on the altar. And even before that, on the 10th day, you shall select a Lamb and, and have it. And it was on the 10th day, I believe, that Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on, on the donkey. Anyway, then the first day of unleavened bread was when they left Egypt and sin and leaven behind them. It was after the Passover, we leave, leave, leave sin behind, become a new creation. And then not a holy day, but special day, the wave sheaf day, when the first of the barley harvest was presented to God as very fine flour that was raised up to sanctify, to ask God to sanctify the rest of the barley harvest. And again, that pictured Jesus, which on that first day of the weeks, as it is in the Greek originally, on that very first day is when he ascended to heaven to be accepted by the Father for the rest of the spiritual harvest. Right on the very day, no doubt he went up at the very moment, I think around 9 a.m., or the very moment the high priest was raising the barley flour to God, he was raising up to heaven uh, on the exact second I have a sermon on the wave sheaf day. And then Pentecost pictured the harvesting of the early uh, harvest, the first fruits, the smaller harvest of barley and then wheat. Uh, the big harvest was in the fall. But Pentecost was when Jehovah gave his people his Torah, his law, and Holy Spirit. It was also when Jehovah married Israel at Mount Sinai. It's about the time that 
Boaz and Ruth got married, which pictured Christ and his bride, the church. I believe Pentecost in a future year is when Christ will marry the church in heavenly Jerusalem with God the Father's blessing. So I see Pentecost as a transition holy day. It pictures what's already been, the giving of the Torah and the Holy Spirit, the seal of the promise of more to come, kind of like an engagement ring, if you will. And yet there's more to come. There's the wedding supper of the Lamb yet to happen, which I really believe will happen on Pentecost. I'll explain that more as we go through here, but I explain it very carefully also in the sermon, I go prepare a place for you. If you want to look that one up, I gave that, I believe, in the spring or summer a couple years ago. So the spring holy days picture God opening the door to salvation to those he is calling now. He is not calling everyone now or else he's failing. And he's not failing. The spring holy days is about what Christ does with and for those being called now. Spring Holy Days focus more on events that have happened already, is what I'm saying. Though Pentecost is a transition year, uh, I mean, uh, Holy Day. The Spring Holy Days focus on God's people who receive His Spirit, those being called now. The Fall Holy Days, on the other hand, when you understand this broad outline, it really helps. The Fall Holy Days picture those who will be called later the ones who uh, will be saved after Yeshua returns and sets up the millennial reign on earth. The fall holy days focus on how God and Christ go about saving the rest of humanity, including those who have all died, never having even heard the name Jesus or Yeshua. The fall holy days start with this day, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, the day of blasts and shouts. It's a mixed day. Some, God's children, will be thrilled with this day. and But those fighting Messiah, the King of Kings, are in for a terrible time. It's called the day of the God's vengeance, day of God's wrath, a dark and gloomy and very dangerous time, dangerous day. You want to be on the right side of God for this day, that's for sure. You want to make sure you have the seal you have his number, you have his seal, not the beast number, but God's name in, 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 uh, sealed on your forehead, inscribed on your forehead to protect you. There is a one-year period. Now, that, get this now. There's a one-year period called the Day of the Lord, or as I prefer to say, the Day of Jehovah. But you're probably more familiar with Day of the Lord, so I'll say that in this sermon, this particular sermon. I believe the Day of the Lord... I'm going to use D-T-O-L in my notes, Day day of the Lord, Uh, very, very likely starts on trumpets a year before he returns and lands on the Mount of Olives and ends on the Feast of Trumpets a year later. Now, how do we know that? Because I think the Holy Days always picture something very meaningful. And yet Christ says of that day and hour, no one knows. I'll explain that later. It's going to be so dark and gloomy, it even says, the earth will be knocked out of its orbit, will be moved out of its place, slightly, very slightly, or else we'd all be doomed, but enough to make it difficult to even know what day is what. I'll repeat that again later. So let's talk about the day of the Lord for a second. Remember that a uh, day of the Lord is actually a year long. Isaiah 34, verse 8 says, It's the day of the Lord of Jehovah's judgment, a year of recompense. Okay, so it's a year long, Isaiah 34, 8. I do recommend that on your own you make a note here to read Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, verses 5 to 13. Here it describes a time of war, a time of destruction, man in pain like a woman giving birth because of their fear, a time of darkness when the moon and the sun And the stars won't give their light, won't be visible. Probably from all the debris in the air, from all the volcanic eruptions, perhaps from um, nuclear blasts, the results of war, fires. It's a time of punishing the world for evil, Isaiah 13, 11. 
And then in Isaiah 13, 13, it says, The earth shall be shaken and moved out of her place in the day of fierce anger of Jehovah. Fierce anger. We know the great tribulation is Satan's anger against God's children. Well, after a little bit of that, God steps in the final year and says, Okay, time for my vengeance and my wrath on all of you, the way you've been treating my family and the earth and everything else. I am really ticked off. (laughs) So Amos 5, verses 18 and 19 goes on to say, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Now, it's okay for us to desire it, because we're looking forward to the return of Christ. But those who are not on God's side, and I'll show you verses that say that, Hebrews 9.24, if you want to cross-reference that, that uh, we we look forward to his coming. It's okay for us. But if you're not on his side, woe to those who desire the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, a day of darkness, not light. And since the Feast of Trumpet falls on the first sighting of light of the new moon, it may be impossible to be sure when that day is, as the moon won't be giving its light. Joel 1.15 calls it a day of destruction from the Almighty. Joel 2, verses 1 and 2, calls it a day of trembling Deep darkness and gloominess. I'm just giving you the scriptures. I really don't have the time to read all of them. But you can write these down and look them up yourself. Joel 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, Verse 1, blow the trumpet. Sound the alarm. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble. And the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. And then verse 2 speaks of a massive invading army coming as so large as never been seen before. Talk about being a fearsome thing. And they come ravishing women, raping them, burning houses. It's not a good time. Joel 2.11 calls it a... uh, This is in the land of Israel where this is happening. Joel 2.11 calls it a day that is great and very terrible. Who could endure it? Joel 3.9-16, and please read it, says the word goes out to all the nations to prepare for war. Come on down. Beat your pruning hooks into... Swords and your, you know, and your plows and so on into weapons of war. It's a cataclysmic time. They will be gathered to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is that area all around Jerusalem, uh, the valley of decision. That's the area around Jerusalem, and the context is again centering on the day of the Lord. Joel 3, verses 12 to 13. Let the nations be awakened, come and, and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there, this is God speaking, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. should include Iran and Iraq probably in there too. Come on down, go down, for the winepress is full, and their wickedness is great. There are many, many more scriptures that call the day of the Lord a day of wailing and terror, destruction. It's not a good time here on earth. Isaiah 13, I talked about that, even the planet being moved. Isaiah 34, 8, that it's a year. It's a year of recompense. So the day of the Lord is really one year leading up to finally him landing on the Mount of Olives. It's also a day of his vengeance. Many verses call it his day of his vengeance. Remember, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is not a bad thing if you leave it up to God. Jeremiah 46.10. So, okay, that's the background. Now, I'm going to talk now about the return of Christ as he comes in a twofold return. This is the time when Yeshua, Jesus, returns to this time as a conquering king. Delivering his people, wreaking havoc on his enemies. The Lion of Judah roars. But Isaiah 31, verses 4 and 5 says, the, Lu- the Lion of Judah roars. So what's left in the timeline of God's plan? Remember I said that the holy days seem to have major events happen on them. The anointed Messiah. In fact, I would say that all these holy days probably had major births happen on them. You know, there's a, there, there's a thinking that Abraham was born on this day, for example. Uh, David, born on a holy day. I think it was this day as well. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, 
I have to get my notes on that, but big events. So what's left in the timeline? Basically, the anointed Messiah has to return. That's left. He has to collect or gather his bride together. I hope I'm in there. I hope you are. And that includes many thousands and thousands he will resurrect and thousands who are living who will be changed to spirit at the last trump of God, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. I'll read those later as we have time for them, but they're powerful verses that have a lot to do with part of the meaning of this day. He returns to earth twice. I believe that with all my being. There are two distinctly different descriptions of how he returns. First, we start with the day of the Lord, which lasts one year before he actually comes back. Remember the day lasts one year, Isaiah 34, 8. And in the seventh seal of Revelation 8 and 9, it starts talking about the seventh seal in Revelation 7, but it starts going to detail in Revelation 8 and 9. There are seven trumpets that are blown and plagues that are associated with the seven trumpets. Now follow me here. You have seven seals. The fifth seal, for example, is the Great Tribulation. The sixth seal is the heavenly signs <clears throat> and all that going on. And then the seventh seal is composed of seven trumpet plagues. Excuse me just a second. And so, seven trumpet plagues. The fifth trumpet plague alone lasts five months. And that's, after, okay, and then after the seventh trumpet, there are seven more plagues. So a lot's going on. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and then seven last plagues in that sequence. So the final year of the Lord starts. The trumpets then of the seventh seal are beginning to sound one after the other. And they culminate in the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet. There are no more trumpets after that until after Christ has landed. There's another great trumpet. That's, that's something else, though. So what happens then? Turn to Revelation 11. We can read it. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Here's an example of where the Bible speaks of Jehovah ruling on the earth. That that Jehovah, according to this verse here, has to be Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. I hope you hear my series I'm giving on Jehovah. Very important we get that right. Jehovah is God the Father. Yehovah is Yeshua, depending on the context, and they are as one. Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give, thanks, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. And then verse 18, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And they shall be judged that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name. Yehovah is his name, small and great. And should destroy those who destroy the earth. We should be people who are doing everything we can to keep things clean, restored, renewed, beautiful. God will destroy those who destroy the earth. That's Revelation 11:18. And then the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. There were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake and great hail. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will, will not precede those who are asleep, those who have died. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16 now. First Thessalonians, New Testament 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, 
in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. From that time on, we're always going to be with him. But notice that verse, and also Matthew 24 says that Christ is coming back in the clouds. Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes, ethnic groups of the earth, will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. I say it that way because there's another time he comes on a mighty, white, spiritual, spirit stallion, spirit being, an angelic being, a smart being. With power and great glory, it says, coming on the clouds, he'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, but, but again, he's coming in the clouds of his first coming, as he comes, uh, his first return, I'm saying. Uh, keep in mind, too, before I forget, that trumpets were sounded on all the holy days. The silver trumpets certainly were. All the holy days. All the new moons, for that matter. But anyway, great trumpet of God sounds, and the Son of God returns. He's visible to everybody around the whole world. It seems like, seems like lightning flashing vigorously and violently from in view of everybody as it circles around the whole earth. The, the appearance of him circles. The first return is to gather his bride. In that return, the Savior comes on clouds, gathers the bride, as I've just read. That's after the great tribulation, according to Matthew twenty four twenty nine. After the tribulation of those days, he gathers his elect. So the elect are still on earth. They haven't been zoomed up to heaven in a rapture. According to Yeshua's own words, anyway. According to Yeshua's own words, Matthew twenty four twenty nine. After the tribulation, he's got to collect his people from around the world. That all happens at the seventh trumpet, according to Revelation 11. But after the seventh trumpet of the seventh seal, there are still seven last plagues that begin in Revelation 15, verse 1. I hope you can follow what I'm saying here. That's why you want the notes, probably. Those seven plagues take time. At least, I'd say at least four or five months or more. So something has to be going on during that time. We're not just hovering over earthly Jerusalem for months, doing nothing. In my own view of things, the resurrection of the body of Christ, the church, I don't hear anybody else saying this, It's my view of things. I could be wrong. I could be right. (laughs) So we'll see when Christ returns. The resurrection of the body of Christ, the church, likely will happen before Pentecost, maybe on the first day of unleavened bread, which pictured Israel coming out of sin, coming out of Egypt, and being freed. Wouldn't it be neat if we, the Israel of God, are freed from the earth, which is total sin at that point, and change to spirit, taken up to the clouds to meet Christ, from there to go on to heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, to what? To get married, which I believe will then happen on Pentecost. Some believe the resurrection happens on Pentecost. Most think the resurrection happens on trumpets. I believe one of the spring holy days makes the much more sense Why? Because it's about harvesting the first fruits, which always falls in the spring holy days. It makes no sense for us to be resurrected on a holy day that has to do with the rest of the world, with the large harvest at the end of the age. The harvesting of those being called now is a Spring Holy Day event. Fall Holy Days is about everyone else. Are you getting what I'm saying? Anyway, so we're resurrected, and I don't believe we're resurrected on Pentecost. I think it's before Pentecost. Who knows? Maybe it's on Wave Sheet Day, which really pictures Christ, but we are the body of Christ. The head of that body has already uh, already gone up on that day. 
But I think it's probably more the first day of unleavened bread. We'll, we'll see. And it will picture the time when we are truly incorruptible, truly sinless, which the days of unleavened bread picture. I don't know of anyone else teaching this, so we'll see what happens. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I, I think it makes sense, though. So after he collects his bride, he wants to marry her. Where would you have a wedding? Can't be here on earth. It's all in disastrous condition. When you read the context of Revelation 15 onwards, there's so much going on in heaven, and especially by the time you get to Revelation 19, which is about the wedding of the Lamb and the bride, it clearly is saying in clear words, then I heard a voice in heaven, then this happened in heaven. Go back and read it. So in fact, the city of heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, is even called the bride. Because that's that will be my city. That will be your city. It's the city of the wife of Christ. The rest of the world, when they are saved, will have cities all over the new earth, new heavens, new earth, and all over the world will be their city. My city and your city is the same city that Abraham pined for, a city whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11. I don't know the verse. I think it's around verse 10 or 11. Hebrews 11. Uh, he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. And so do I. And so do you. That is our city. Abraham got, got the idea. So now we're going to count 50 days to the wedding on Pentecost. Pentecost is count 50. Uh, it, it's counting the time. And Pentecost pictures the, uh, the, the smaller harvest. Others believe the resurrection happens on Pentecost. I personally think for, it might be the first day of unleavened bread. Then we count the day. So after he collects the bride, he wants to marry her. And that place is likely going to be heaven. Uh, has to be heaven, as, as I understand in Revelation 19. Now, the spirit, I love the Revelation 22, 17, where it says, The Spirit and the Bride, working together with Christ, the Spirit and the Bride welcome people to come, so you and I will be working very intimately with the King, our beloved King, our wonderful Redeemer, our Savior. Hallelujah. Come, Yeshua. Come. We love Him. We love you, Master. Oh, Father, don't delay in sending him. Hallelujah. Well, the wedding takes place most likely on the day picturing that, which is the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, God gave Israel the Torah on Pentecost, the law. He gave the New Covenant Church a wedding ring promise of more to come, the Holy Spirit. Okay, the down payment, commitment to finish it. I'm confident the great wedding of the Lamb and His bride will occur on a Pentecost day in the future, not that many years from now. I'm thinking it's got to be, I hope, within 20 years. I don't think it's going to be in two or three years. I think it's going to be within 20, though. But I don't know. It doesn't matter when. You have to be ready now. Now, again, for years we've been told the first resurrection for those being called now occurs on the Feast of Trumpets, but again, that would be a fall holy day. Again, that makes no sense. Surely the resurrection will have to occur on a spring holy day, and then the wedding itself takes place on Pentecost, because that's what it all pictures. That's when God married Israel the first time. That's when he's going to marry the Israel of God, the the spirit church of God composed of Gentiles and Israelites. No doubt in my mind on the day of Pentecost. And all this is taking place during... A little past the middle of the day of the Lord, half the year has gone by already of the day of the Lord, and it's now leading up to a second return. We're up in heaven. What's happening here on earth? The last seven plagues are being poured out here on earth. So, let me say again, when Christ returns the first time, it's on the clouds. He collects his bride. He returns to heaven to present his bride to the Father and marry her by taking her into the temple. When the temple doors at that point are closed. This is pictured by Rebecca. Abraham pictures God the Father. Isaac pictures Yeshua, the son, who has to get married. And the father sends his servant out to collect the bride. The father sends angels out to collect the bride. And what did Rebecca do? She went back to where the father was. 
where Abraham was and the son was there also. And so then what happened? We can read in Genesis 24, 67 that Isaac fell in love with Rachel, I mean Rebecca instantly and took her into his mother Sarah's tent. Now Sarah had died a little while before that, but the tent was still there. He took her into Sarah's tent to consummate their wedding. Paul says, Sarah, in Galatians 4, verses 23 to 28, Paul says, Galatians 4, 23 to 28, that Sarah pictures heavenly Jerusalem. All of these were pictures for our edifications. Rebecca pictured the church, the bride of Christ, who's going to go back to meet Yeshua, who is there with the Father, takes her into Sarah's tent, pictured by which pictures heavenly Jerusalem according to Galatians four twenty three to twenty eight consummates the marriage there with us. How will we do that spiritually? Now, King Yeshua and his bride are married. And the next thing we read of is that they elect angels, return to earth on spirit horses, massive invasion, and a massive, massive invasion to fight and eradicate millions of soldiers gathered to fight Christ. Those millions of armies and soldiers, I mean, are all around Jerusalem, stretching from Megiddo in the north, all the way down to Jerusalem. You know, on D-Day, in June of 19... What was it, 44? What year was that? (laughs) Anyway, um, D-Day. 6,939 ships were massed against the Normandy beaches. 6,000. This is going to be an, an army of angelic army of millions and hundreds of millions of powerful beings. I believe his second return of the line of Judah, Yeshua, the king of kings, happens most likely on a holy day, most likely on this day, the Feast of Trumpets at the end of the year-long day of the Lord, right to the very day. People on earth will have no idea what time it is, what day it is. Everything electronic will not be working because of um, surges from the sun, uh, from nuclear destruction, Interruption, nothing electronic will, is likely to be working. Power grids will be down, cars won't run, trucks won't run, watches won't run. Everything will be destroyed. There's so much gloominess and darkness on top of that, you can't even see the sun or moon to figure out, is this daytime or nighttime? In Revelation 19, let's read it, verses 7 to 10. Oh, turn with me to Revelation 19. I'm going to read a lot from this. Be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. But that righteousness is given to us. And as Christ comes in us, we're able to be righteous and live righteously. Verse 9, then he said to me, write. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true saying of God. Let's go to verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened. Notice where this is happening. Notice where this is happening. In heaven. Revelation 19, 1, 2, and 3 will tell you it's also in heaven. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name dipped by many crowns. It means he's coming as king of kings. He's just not the king of England or the king of Jordan or whatever. He is king over all the earth. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So who is this one faithful and true? He's the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. When God sent his word to the prophets, the word of God came to them. The word of Yehovah came. That was always Yeshua. And the armies in heaven 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, these undoubtedly are angelic spirit beings that look like horses. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Praise you, Yeshua. Praise you. Love you. Come. Father, please let him come. Several scriptures indicate that the saints and the bride will be with Christ, uh, not just angels. You can read 1 Thessalonians 3.13. It says the Lord's coming with his saints. 1 Thessalonians 3.13. Jude 14 and 15 with tens of thousands of his saints. Zechariah 14.5. I'll put all these in the notes. And so on. Anyway, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the heaven of heavens, uh, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of captains. Okay, and then verse 19, I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence and who deceived everyone who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with a sword as proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So it's a very, very huge battle. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 4, describes it. Behold, Zechariah, I'm now in the Old Testament, towards the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 4. Behold, the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. Did you get that? Initially, the Jews lose. Initially. Or will be losing. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women raped, ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then Jehovah will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet, this is the Messiah that Jews were looking for when, when Jesus came. They asked him, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And even in the blessing, uh, I think it was Zechariah's praying about John the Baptist, how he's preparing the way of the Lord who will destroy the enemies and set up the kingdom. That's what they thought would happen with his first coming. And it didn't happen. That's one reason why they don't accept Yeshua as their king, as their, as their coming promised Messiah, who is going to restore Jerusalem and Israel to number one nation. Anyway, Ye- uh, Yehovah, Je- Zechariah 14.3, Yehovah will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I've s- spent so many hours on the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two uh, towards the north and south. It goes on to say in Zechariah 14 how uh, those armies are defeated. God is going to, and it's horrible, frankly, but uh, you fight God, you, you're in bad shape. He's going to dissolve the flesh, dissolve the flesh right off their bones, the tongues out of their eye sockets, and the tongue, I mean, out of their, uh, out of their mouth, I mean, and the, the eyes, eyeballs out of their uh, eye sockets will all be dissolved. All be dissolved. That's Zechariah 14, verses 12 to 13. You can read that on your own. So there's coming soon, within two decades, I think, an invasion of hundreds of millions of powerful military spirit angels of God, angels of war, backing up their leader, whom you know as Jesus, the Yeshua, coming as the Lion of Judah, roaring. Roaring for his people will be seen by everyone around the world as he flashes like lightning. That spirit leader will be Jesus Christ coming in glory and power. Come, Yeshua, come. We're told all the nations will ultimately come against Jerusalem. And then the king of kings will intervene. The bloodbath I've just described, the battle of Armageddon. And yet uh, you can read about it also how there'll be a time before all this 
of apparent peace and prosperity, people building homes and getting married, and Jews and Arabs probably uh, making peace treaties, formal, uh, former mortal enemies, uh, a time when people are proclaiming peace, peace, and then sudden destruction. I think it will be a time when the third temple will be rebuilt or is being built. And look out. You start seeing the third temple being rebuilt. You start seeing peace between uh, the Palestinians and Israel and everything going hunky-dory, the economy booming. Look out. Peace, peace, and then sudden destruction. Be in the days as in the days of Lot. Everything was going fine. Lot and dragged out of uh, God's mercy with his wife and two daughters. And then, boom, the whole city is destroyed. Same thing with Noah. I think probably the ark was done being built for a long time and just sat there. And Noah's being derided and ridiculed. And then the time came. God said, it's time. And God gathered all the animals, put them in the ark, led them into the ark, put Noah in there, and God sealed that door. God did. One door. And then sudden destruction came on the whole world. I want to remind you now, moving aside a little bit, Leviticus 23, 23, where it says it's a memorial of trumpets. The word trumpets is actually teruah, blasts, shouts. And remember, on all the holy days, the trumpets were sounded. There were two trumpets that were sounded on the holy days, silver trumpets that were blown. Uh, Solomon later on made it 120 silver trumpets on the holy days. Can you imagine that? These were blown only by priests every holy day, every new moon, or to gather the people. But besides the silver trumpets, there were also other trumpets, the ram's horns, known as shofars, the curved ram's horn, which was to remind them to bow themselves before him whom, for, before whom they, uh, they, they presented themselves. Nowadays, they also use long kudu horns, long curly kudu horns. They could be three or four feet long, you know, some of these. Mine's about three feet long, I think. And um, the shofar was blown on trumpets 100 times. The shofar was used on the Feast of Trumpets. It was a gold gilded one. expert on the shofar, but that gives you an idea. That's my own shofar being blown on the Feast of Trumpets. I don't know if that came out on the audio or not. That's my own uh, shofar. Nowadays they use kuda horns like I just used. The uh, smaller, I have a smaller ram's horn. I find that one harder to blow. I haven't done this for a long time, but... That's my little ram's horn without any practice. So <laughs> anyway, it gives you an idea. That's what it sounded like. Those were the same shofars, the same kind of shofar that Gideon blew with 300 men. That was the same one that the priests used when they circled uh, Cain, uh, yeah, um, Jordan, uh, uh, when they crossed the Jordan and um, Jericho is what I'm trying to think of, when they circled Jericho. And uh, the first time the word shofar is actually used, that's worth a... Uh, that's worth a blog title, by the way, uh, the, the, the Law of First Times. Uh, the first time a word is used in the Bible, it's usually significant. And so um, the very first time that word is used, I believe, is Exodus 19:16, where it says, The voice of the trumpet uh, was sounded on the day that uh, God appeared, uh, came down to, to uh, Mount Sinai to give the Ten Commandments. Um, the King James Version says, The voice of the trumpet. And... Um, in Exodus 19:19, 19, 19, when the blast, 
or the voice of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. So the Hebrew word here for shofar, by the way, has a word picture. If you understand word pictures, I need to talk about that soon. Is the prince speaks. That's the word picture. I find that fascinating. So Exodus 19, 19 says the voice of the trumpet. And so uh, this is also the trumpet that was blown on the Jubilee. The shofar was blown at Jericho. The shofar is the one that's blown on Exodus 33 watchman blowing the trumpet when he sees danger. Um, they blew the shofar when uh, that kind of trumpet when there was a king being anointed, usually in the spring. It sounded uh, the battle alarm. It sounded in victory times. In June 1967, when the Jews retook Jerusalem, Rabbi Shlomo Gorin blew the shofar on the Temple Mount for the first time in almost 1900 years after the Jews won the Six-Day War. His name, by the way, Shlomo means Solomon, or is Solomon in Hebrew, and his last name, Gorin, means, are you ready for this? Threshing floor. Remember where the temple was built? It was built on the threshing floor that David bought from the Jebusite, which was on Mount Moriah, where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. The temple was built on Mount Moriah, on the threshing floor. And the guy whose name means threshing floor blew the shofar in 1967. And then 50 years later, a man whose name is Trump, again, changed the uh, or uh, uh, allowed the capital city to be Jerusalem. You know, on, on a jubilee year, the, the, the land comes back to the people. I think it's all very exciting. So I hope you blow a shofar today at your church services. If not, you should ask if it be done. Jews blow it a hundred times, remember. And so, so uh, uh, again, we shouldn't be caught off guard by the coming of Yeshua. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 10 um, warns us, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 10. I'm so excited by this day, aren't you? I really am. I really am. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write, write to you, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 now. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yehovah comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Peace and safety as labor pains on a pregnant woman. That would be a great... I, I wish a woman would write a blog for me about how labor pains for a woman giving birth, um, the, you know, the, the, the time, the things that happen during birth and, uh, and how that tells you how soon it's going to be now uh, and so on. Just, I, I'd love to have one of you ladies write a great blog expounding on that verse. You're a woman. You can do it for me. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should come upon you as a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of the day. And then verse 9, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. It should not come as a big surprise to all of us, he says. Now let's go to where are we now in the sequence of things? Let's recap real quick and pick up some more. Okay, so we've been resurrected, the Spirit. Well, before that, though, before that, the year of the Lord starts. Okay, one year before he lands on the Mount of Olives. The year of the Lord starts. And then about halfway through that year of the Lord, we're resurrected to spirit beings, I believe in the spring, Immortal, incorruptible now, like 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 52 or so says. And we've been taken now to be with Yeshua and his angels coming in the clouds. He came on a cloud. Everyone sees it. And we've been taken now to heaven to be married to Yeshua, our king, our beloved king. The one we had fallen so deeply in love with and fall deeper in love with all the time. While the seven last plagues after the seven, the seven trumpet remembers when we're resurrected. Okay, uh, that's the seven trumpet. After that, there are seven last plagues. So while we're in heaven getting married, the seven last plagues are being poured out on earth as God's punishment. 
And then when that's done, we get married. And then when that's done, we return with our husband, Yeshua, and millions of his angels, all riding powerful, intelligent, spirit-being horses. Now, we're, we're married, I believe, on Pentecost, and I believe we're in heaven for a few months in earth time, there's no time or, you know, time and space in heaven, but, but in earth time, months have gone by, and now we're in the fall, and on the, on the Feast of Trumpets, I believe, we return to the earth on white spirit chargers with Christ and the armies, the angelic armies. There are massive armies facing us. It's okay, we're spirit, they can't hurt us. We'll allow them to see us, apparently, but they can't hurt us. Yeshua wipes them out. We then land on the Mount of Olives, which splits in two. And now we're on the earth as spirit beings. As spirit beings. The earth is in a mess. A total mess. I suspect only a tenth of humanity remains alive. And that coming back to Earth is going to be the most massive D-Day invasion the world has ever seen. Frankly, it saved the world from itself before they wiped everybody out. For if he has, if Matthew 24 says, if he didn't come when he, when he does come, there'd be no flesh saved alive. Now we're on Earth. We're already married. We're spirit. Now the cleanup and restoration begins. Satan has to be put away. And now we start opening the door to the world that they can be forgiven of what they've done. But before that, the Israelite nations, peoples, who have been sent into captivity, have to be brought back to the land. And it's called, uh, it's not the last trump, it's the great trump of God. It sounded, again, a big shofar blast, traditionally to be on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the captive and scattered Israelites and Jews are freed from Egypt, from the Arab countries, from all the pagan nations around them or Gentile nations around them who have bought them as slaves. There's human trafficking going on now. Don't be surprised if, if I say slaves, you'll say that can't happen. It's, Slavery is happening now. There are girls, especially, and young boys who are being sold now. Isaiah 27, verses 12 to 13, shall come to pass in that day that Jehovah will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you'll be gathered one by one, you children of Israel. So it shall be in that day, I'm reading Isaiah 27, verse 13 now. Middle of the Old Testament. Isaiah 27, verse 13. So it shall be in that day the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. And they who were outcasts in the land of Egypt. Now the ancient location of the land of Assyria was Iran. I mean Iraq, I mean Iraq. But we believe the ancient Assyrians are probably many of the Germanic peoples who have gone to uh, Europe. And they who are outcasts from the land of Egypt and shall worship Jehovah in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Now this truly is a day of joy for Jehovah's children, but a terribly tough day for those opposing him. Uh, Psalm 89, 15. Blessed are the people who know the teruah, the joyful sound. The teruah, the blast, the shouts, who know the joyful sound, it says here. They walk. O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance, they walk, Jehovah. I have believed for many years that Yeshua returns in Jubilee years. No one knows for sure when that is. Some believe 1967 was a Jubilee year and 2017 was, they think, with the reestablishment of Jerusalem as a capital by the leader of the greatest nation on earth, the United States, by a man whose name is Trump, which sounds on the Jubilee, in the Jubilee year. And by the way, Donald, 
can mean in the, I think in the, certainly in the English or, or uh, Scottish meaning of Donald is world leader. I don't know if you knew that or not. I don't like a lot about Donald Trump, but he is the one God has put there. And God put Obama in there. And God put Trump in there. God is the one who sets our kings in place. What's the point of all of us, of all of this? Okay? That what's the point for all of us? It's the day of repentance. It's of seeking our Father and our King, this day is. It's a time to reset our relationships. Our relationships with Yehovah, with Yeshua, with one another. We believers have to become one now before the wedding. I don't believe Jesus Christ is going to gather the elect from around the world who are made up of people who for the most part want nothing to do with each other. We've got to stop being like that. We might have our doctrinal disagreements. There's a man I respect very much. And we have a lot in common. But some things we disagree on. It's okay. He's my brother. I love him very much. He knows who he is. <laughs> I hope he loves me as much as I love him, because I do. Now, Joel 2, verses 15 to 17, Blow the trumpet, the shofar in Zion, consecrate a fast. We need to be fasting before God, not just on the Day of Atonement, but seeking him with all of our heart. Call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. This is so important. He says, let the bridegroom come out of his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Come on, don't even finish and consummate your marriage. This is more important. Let the priests who minister to Jehovah weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Jehovah, and do not give your heritage to reproach. In Joel 3, Joel 3, verse 19, verses 9 to 17, it says, Proclaim to the nations, prepare for war. In the Valley of Decision, I read that earlier. And then Joel 3, 16, Jehovah will roar from Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem. This is what this day is all about. And verse 17, you shall know that I am Jehovah, your God. Again, who is this who's coming? It's Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Remember, we read that in Revelation 19. And he had a name called the Word of God. We know who the Word of God is. And here it says it's Yovah. Now you shall know that I am Yovah, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. And Jerusalem shall be holy, and no angel shall ever overrun it again. It says pass through it again. That's, that's, that doesn't mean no Gentiles or aliens will ever go through there again, because we know that all the nations who survive the attack are going to come and worship him in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. But it means no, no aliens and Gentiles will ever take over Jerusalem again. God hates it, by the way, when we divide up his land. I think it's in the book of Amos. I'm mad at all of you, who I'm angry at all of you, who have divided my land. I hope President Trump does not give away the West Bank or make that part of a big negotiation or something like that. Every single time the Jews have given up land, major things have come back to hit those who did that. Uh, one prime minister, uh, ex-prime minister now, was hit with a terrible stroke when he gave up part of Gaza, I think it was, or gave up Gaza. Don't do it. So what's the point of all this? There's so much more that can be said. It's a time of repentance, resetting our relationship. Christ, I hope, will come within 20 years. Much sooner than that, I hope. Now the time is to be sure you're zealous and right with Abba, right with Yeshua. Be sure you're centering your lives on them. Be sure you're praying often, certainly daily. Be sure you're in the Word of God daily. Be sure you love Yeshua, your Messiah, your beloved one you're going to marry. Talk to him, love him, seek him. Be sure uh, God's Spirit is guiding you, leading you, speaking in you, praying with you. You have a high, high calling, brethren. Don't let anything or anyone distract you. Even every day that the sun sets means we're one day closer now, one day closer now to the return of our king. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Let's pray his kingdom come. Dedicate yourself to him. Repent. 
this should be a day that we, the bride of Christ, the children of God, look forward to with joyous anticipation, not with any dread. I'll give you one verse that says that, and there are many that do. Hebrews 9.28. Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, verse Hebrews 9.28, to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. We should have confidence and boldness in the judgment. First John 4.17 says, so the next holy day after this is going to, isn't that a wonderful message though of, of what this means, what this, what this holy day is all about? I'm not saying I'm wonderful. I'm saying he's wonderful. Next holy day will be Yom Kippur, day of covering, day of atonement. It's a day of solemn fasting. And notice I've just read it. Who bears the sins of many? I just read it. Hebrews 9.28. To those who eagerly... Wait, wait, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. All our sins are put upon him. It's just a little teaser for Day of Atonement. On him. It's a day of solemn fasting. Christ bears our sins. It's only Christ who bears the sins of many. More on this on Day of Atonement. It will be a day of fasting and solemn repentance. It will be a day of judgment for the nations around Jerusalem. If you're learning from this website, I hope you'll tell others about it and tell them the good news that you're learning from this website. So until next time, this is your brother in Messiah with the good news of our awesome, awesome Father, Almighty God, and our Savior in his kingdom, to which there will never be an end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> yah is the short form of Jehovah. Praise your name, Jehovah. May Yehovah bless you, smile upon you, and bring you joyous peace. And I want to end with the words of John the Apostle. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come. Revelation 22, verse 20. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this message of hope that we have. We know that we're in for some rough times ahead, but you'll be there with us and watching over us and protecting us. Praise you for that. We praise Yeshua, our Savior, upon whom all the sins of many were, were put on him. Thank you, Yeshua, our beloved, beloved Savior. We just love you so much. Love you so much. Let us now adore you in obedience, adore you in worship, adore you in living the lifestyle. Come live. Inside me and all who hear this, Yeshua, please change me, change all of us to be more like you, that they see you and not me, not, not, not ourselves. We see you. You are so wonderful, Father, and so wonderful, Yeshua. May you be joyful and happy with your children. May we come and seek you with all of our being. Bless your people as they get ready for the Feast of Tabernacles, as they travel.